Hello. <laughs> well, hopefully you're in here because you are interested in hearing about um, you know where PHP has gone or where PHP has come from in security wise and where it's going in future versions. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the language itself and also the community that's kind of grown around um, you know the security aspects and secure development. Uh, first off, a little bit of background about me. I've been doing PHP for 15 plus years. Um, I've been focusing on application security for the past couple of years, uh, and I am a secure developer, uh, security developer at Pardot, which is a child company of Salesforce. Um, if you're interested in following me on Twitter, um, you can follow my account, uh, Enigma, or you can follow the Securing PHP. Um, that's a project that I do where I write various tutorials and try to you know, encourage PHP developers to write more secure code, uh, mostly by providing you know, tutorials and more information and give them information about vulnerabilities, all that kind of good stuff. So we'll start off with a little bit of history. Um, PHP has been around for about 20 years um, in various incarnations. Uh, it actually just celebrated its 20th anniversary two months ago, three months ago. Um, and it's definitely come a long way from the personal home pages stuff it started out with. Um, you know, the, the PHP that exists today is a lot more robust, it's a lot more secure. Um, you know, obviously it has its flaws, but it's a lot better off than it used to be, um, absolutely. Um, it's used by over 80% of the web. Um, this includes things like just regular PHP applications and WordPress and Drupal and all those kind of other good pieces of software that run on PHP. Um, but it is, I think, by the latest statistics, it's the widely, most widely used uh, language on the web for web applications. Um, the latest version is PHP 5.6. That first release of that one was released a couple of months ago. Um, it's brand spanking new, and they've got a couple of point releases on it right now that have some security updates and various fixes in it. Um, uh, real quick, how many people in here are actually using PHP in their applications? Awesome, good. I won't ask what versions you're on. <laughs> um, because um, unfortunately, well, so let me just say, uh, PHP 7 is coming in late 2015. Uh, I know we're kind of already in late 2015, but I think the third release candidate is out now, and I believe the stable for it is coming in um, October. Um, all fingers crossed, obviously. Um, unfortunately, the most widely installed version is PHP 5.3, uh, thanks to lovely hosting providers out there, but 5.4 is slowly overtaking it, so they're pretty far behind if, um, you know, if people are using shared hosting, that kind of stuff, they're using 5.3 and 5.4. Um, there's been lots of campaigns to try to talk to hosting providers and get things updated. Uh, obviously, if you're running your own servers and your own systems, definitely bump it up to 5.6 if, if uh, at all possible. Um, with 7 coming, there's a whole lot of changes. Um, some of the stuff that, uh, that's coming, I'm going to actually talk about because um, it's a little bit more security related and consistency related. Um, but there's tons of other stuff that's coming with uh, PHP 7. Um, how many people heard of PHP 6? Six? No, not really? Good. Because <laughs> it doesn't exist. Um, so PHP 7 is the next, uh, the next major version. Um, there was a whole big debacle where everybody thought PHP 6 was going to be the end-all, be-all, and it was going to be um, you know, amazing Unicode support across the entire language. Uh, people wrote books about it, wrote articles about it. It was this huge deal, and then it never happened. Um, you know, they realized just how difficult it would be to implement all that stuff in, in a language uh, the size of PHP. And so they took some of those things that they were going to update the language with, put them into 5.4, and then dropped the Unicode stuff for later on. Um, PHP 7 is going to have some of that stuff in it, uh, but not all the, you know, the, the language-wide support that was initially anticipated. Um, so if you go looking for PHP manuals or uh, PHP books and articles, if it says anything about PHP 6, move on because it's not accurate. Uh, the language itself has a formal support schedule, formal release schedule. Um, 5.3 is completely deprecated. It's completely gone. 5.4 as of, I think it was nine weeks ago, something like that, is no longer supported at all, not even security fixes. 5.5 is only in security support, and 5.6 is in full support for a while. Um, you can actually see this supported information on the PHP website. It's constantly updated. Um, so if you want to see where your version is in the current support schedule, you can take a look at that. 
Uh, I do want to give you, give you kind of an idea of some of the community around PHP, uh, particularly as it relates to the security aspect. Um, these are a few of the folks that have contrib contributed to it. Um, Anthony Ferrara was one of the um, instrumental people in getting scalar type hints and the, uh, the new type hinting, the strict type hinting, put into PHP 7. Um, the people there on the bottom are more loosely associated with it. They're ones that have given presentations at conferences and written articles about it. Um, but the ones up top there have really been good advocates for security in the PHP community. Um, you can find all sorts of articles and all sorts of information written by them. Um, Scott here on the end is currently working on an extension to introduce uh, Libsodium into PHP. And hopefully that'll be uh, integrated into the core, uh, a core release later on. Um, how many people using PHP have heard of Composer? Okay, that's pretty good. That's more than I expected. Okay, so Composer, for those that don't know, is the um, latest package manager for PHP. Um, if you've been using PHP for a really long time, I'm sure you've heard of Pear. Uh, that was an old set of libraries that was a little bit more curated. It kind of had to have an approval process. Um, but it was a little bit more centered around coding standards and, you know, and techniques and stuff. Not necessarily around the, the security impl implications of the libraries. Um, Composer is a little bit more of a traditional package manager. It pulls stuff uh, from Packagist um, and uh, is a completely open source project. Uh, Packagist is a website that kind of, it categorizes and contains all of the libraries that people put out there. Um, when you add a repository to GitHub, you can actually add a composer file to it and you go over to Packagist, you add it in, and then the composer command line tool can pull that in automatically. Um, it makes reuse of libraries and reuse of code super easy, uh, a whole lot easier than it used to be. It used to be, you know, you had to download the library, you had to put it in a certain place, you had to include it. Um, everything that runs under Composer uses the, either the PSR0 uh, or PSR4 autoloading standard. And so it can pull the information or pull the files that it needs based on the namespaces inside of the PHP. Um, so you don't have to directly include a whole bunch of files if you want to use a library. You just reference it by namespace and the autoloader will kick in. Uh, Composer comes with its own autoloader as well, so you just include that. Um, the use of it has absolutely exploded over the past couple of years. Um, thanks to the site, you know, the packages site. Um, you can additionally run a, um, what is sort of a packages internally. Um, you can run it and it's called Sadis. And so you can run it with your own private packages uh, and keep everything internal so you don't necessarily have to put it out publicly on GitHub or Bitbucket or anything like that. Um, and you can keep that code and still install it all via Composer. Uh, it is one command. You can either install or update. There's all sorts of other stuff you can do with it, but those are the, the primary ones. Um, and unfortunately, because it's pulling from GitHub, it's pulling from just public repositories out there, there's no vetting of those packages. Um, so you really have to be careful with what you're using. Um, I'll talk in a little bit about some of the standardized packages that are out there um, that have really been developed over the past couple of years and really been vetted. Uh, for different purposes, for you know, different security evaluation purposes. Uh, there are some major frameworks out there, the Zen framework, Symfony, and Laravel. Laravel is a relatively new addition. Um, they have um, predominantly, well, I say that. So Zen framework and Symfony have uh, come up with a security team, a group of developers that actually maintain the, that aspect of the framework. Uh, they release advisories, they release updates to the framework, to the, di the different versions of it, uh, so that, you know, users can, can keep their stuff up to date. Uh, Zen, framework, Zen Framework and Symfony are both working on version 3. Um, the, the main versions right now are version 2 for both of those. Uh, Symfony did, I believe it was about a year ago, they actually had a company come in and do an audit of the code. Um, the Symfony framework is kind of built up of components, um, you know, reusable components, and so they did an evaluation on um, not just the security package that's in there inside the framework, but also on other aspects of the framework as well. Um, so that's a good foundation to build on. Um, the Laravel framework actually builds on top of those same Symfony components. Um, it's got some custom handling, obviously, inside of it to make it a little bit different uh, and a little bit less complex than the regular Symfony framework. Um, but it's still built on those vetted components as well. 
there is a database of vulnerable components. Um, unfortunately, given the, the huge breadth of PHP libraries that are out there, it's kind of a relatively small sampling of it. Um, but it is based on advisories from you know, major projects like Zen Framework and Symfony. Um, as a part of the Composer installation, you can go in um, and you can add in a checking tool that will go and look at this database of vulnerable components and see if anything that you're using is marked as vulnerable, the current version of it, and notify you. Um, I think on the strict version of it, it'll actually prevent you from installing it as well, which is kind of nice. Um, okay, so the Drupal project, um, they have their own security team. Uh, it started about, the project itself started about 15 years ago. Um, and obviously is used by some of the major sites out there, um, whether you know it or not. I believe the White House site is still based on Drupal. Um, they renewed their security efforts a couple of years ago, and they have a dedicated security team that just deals with, um, you know, with reports and, um, you know, bug reports and that kind of stuff that come in. Uh, and they also issue their own security advisories um, and updates as well, independent from some of the other stuff, the composer, uh, composer and installation. Um, and when they do the reviews, they're not just reviewing the core of Drupal, they're also reviewing contributed components as well. Um, obviously, they can't get to all of them that are out there, but the ones, the, the ones that see major use, they're going in and they're actually doing security reviews on those libraries, and they'll issue advisories for those as well. Uh, the next major one, I'm sure everybody's heard of WordPress. It's been around for, well, for about 14 years. Um, it's used currently by 58% of the sites that use any kind of content management system, which is huge. Um, you know, in that 80% that I mentioned at the very beginning, Drupal and WordPress are the primary numbers behind that 80%. Um, there's still a lot of applications out there that are just, you know, plain old PHP kind of stuff that aren't running these two pieces of software. Um, but, uh, you know, fortunately, both WordPress and Drupal have their own dedicated security teams. Um, you know, you can see the security at email address for that. And they do the same kind of thing that Drupal does. They uh, do core components and then they'll also do some of the plugins, do security reviews on some of those. Um, unfortunately, two thirds uh, of the issues that come up with WordPress are due to plugins. They're not actually due to the core WordPress. Um, I know that they have a tradition of keeping backwards compatibility, but they're really good about fixing problems inside of that kind of bubble, I guess, um, you know, security-wise, to keep it up to date and keep things patched and not, you know, worry about, oh, well, it's going to break an old version, so, you know, we're just going to leave this bug in here. So. Um, I did mention that there were some libraries. Um, that these are all Composer installable. Um, that first one is just a random number generator. Um, there's something in PHP 7 that's going to replace that, that, replace the need for that, but it's, since it's still pending, that's out there. Um, there's multi-tool. Um, the respect validation library is actually a super simple library that uh, makes it easy to validate input, you know, ensure that it's actually what you're expecting, that kind of stuff. Um, there's the INI scanner, which goes and looks at your PHP INI configuration and makes recommendations based on uh, best practices, best security practices, so that you can check and be sure that you are protecting your application from the, uh, the server level and not just, you know, from the front end. Uh, the composer library that I mentioned that actually goes out and checks that repository of PHP uh, vulnerable libraries, that's the security checker that does that. It looks at your composer lock file whenever you install those libraries and lets you know if any of them are vulnerable inside of there. Uh, the Diffuse PHP encryption library has actually been vetted um, by various InfoSec members. Um, it's super simple to use, super simple kind of library, um, you know, and it's, it's real easy to include. Um, and then finally, the Twig uh, templating library has kind of become one of the standards as far as templating in PHP. Um, you know, there's obviously, if you're going to be outputting, you know, outputting information back to the page, you know, you can use p plain old PHP, but it's not recommended anymore. Um, you know, there's lots of, uh, lots of tools out there that already integrate the Twig library. Um, Twig is really good for context sensitive escaping. Uh, it actually goes through with a lexer and parser and tries to figure out where the information is in your output. Um, and 
uh, escapes it correctly. It does uh, you know, standard HTML escaping, JavaScript, CSS, you know, all the kind of major contexts. It, it handles that kind of stuff a little bit more automatic. OK, so in 5.6, this is really, oh, 5.5. Five. Um, starting in 5.5 and moving forward, they've really kind of put a push in the language on more enhanced security features, more um, you know, bug fixes and everything. Um, in 5.5, uh, they introduced native password hashing. Uh, before, you could actually use the crypt function to do the same kind of thing and use bcrypt. Um, but with the native password hashing, it is literally a couple of functions that are in there. Uh, you know, you have the password hash, password verify, and password needs rehash. Um, behind the scenes, it's actually using bcrypt. Uh, you can give it a salt if you want to, otherwise it randomly generates the salt. Um, but then it'll spit back that string, that hash string, uh, with a default cost of 10. And, you know, you can store that string. And then whenever they come back in, you just call that password verify with whatever they put in and then the hash to compare it to. And it does a uh, timing attack safe comparison between the hash that it generates from their plain text password um, and then the, the one that you have stored currently. Uh, the password needs rehash is kind of used uh, for kind of future proofing. Um, there is a default, which is bcrypt right now, but in the future, if, you know, if bcrypt gets, um, gets broken, some kind of vulnerability is found in that, then they can actually update that, and then you can call that password needs rehash, and it'll automatically rehash that for you. Uh, you can see this is kind of the old way to do it. You would use crypt, and you would actually specify that odd string um, that you know, would tell it to do bcrypting. Um, but now you can actually use just the password hash, password verify, um, and it's you know a two-line operation, which makes it super simple to integrate into um, you know current PHP applications. Uh, if you're not using 5.5, there is actually a polyfill library that you can go back in and add this stuff. It makes those functions available in the global namespace. So even if you don't have 5.5 or above, please go include that in your in your application and start using that. Um, in 5.6, they actually introduced a, uh, an e-notice that uh, is thrown whenever the crypt was called, or thrown whenever crypt is called with no salt attached to it. Um, yeah, not an ideal situation, but previously it just kind of failed silently, uh, previous to 5.6. Uh, in 5.6, there's also a lot of updates to the OpenSSL functionality. Um, so they changed the um, SSL TLS connections to verify peer uh, by default, which is a huge problem, unfortunately, in a lot of PHP applications because it is so easy, like in curl and everything, to just turn that off, and it doesn't do any verification. Um, so this switches that over to do it by default, so you purposefully have to turn it off uh, if you're making those connections. Uh, it also gives you access to be able to check the fingerprints on the certificates. Um, there's a, one specific function that does that. Um, and then you can set the default ciphers that are used. Uh, there's a, a list from Mozilla that it's pretty long. Um, and you can set those default ciphers, and I believe you can actually set the, um, the order on them as well. And uh, compression is enabled by default now. Um, oh, there it is. You can set that preferred cipher order. Um, so if you want to specify that, get down to that level of detail, you can actually set that. Um, and you can get the protocol and the cipher whenever you need to. Um, before, you, you kind of just had to rely on whatever the setting was and you know, reference that in your application. Um, the, uh, you can set additional SSL contact, context options, um, and you can do the um, SSL TLS verification or version selection. Um, so you can change that if you want to for your requests. Uh, and finally, you can generate uh, public key challenges and extract them from there. Um, all this stuff, there, the, a code example for all this different stuff would have taken up you know, 10 different slides, and I didn't want to bore you with a whole bunch of code. Uh, but if you go look in the PHP manual under the OpenSSL section, um, all this stuff is currently in, again, 5.5.5.6, so you can go take a look at that. Uh, there are settings where you can override the um, certificate path and the file that it wants, uh, wants to use for those connections. Um, and you can use those on a per case basis. Previously, it was only settable in, a, in the INI file, so it was a global kind of setting. 
um, you know, so now you can actually set those as needed um, as a part of those connections uh, in those streams. Uh, those settings are now used with a verify peer as well. Uh, previously, you know, you, you didn't have those, uh, that connection between those. Um, in 5.6, uh, they introduced this hash equals function. Um, obviously, the triple equals is open to timing attack issues. Um, you know, the, uh, there's a lot of applications out there that use that for comparing hashes. Um, and they figured out that that wasn't necessarily always the right way. So in 5.6, uh, and I believe this was something that Anthony Ferrara uh, pushed through the RFC process and actually got integrated into the language as well. Um, that makes it a simple one-line call to actually compare those hashes. Um, there is a function floating around out there that does a polyfill for this stuff uh, for you know versions less than 5.6, um, and it essentially just checks the bytes on the strings. Um, but this kind of does it in a single, you know, a single function call and makes it super easy to uh, to do that. Um, there's the deprecation of the evaluation or the eval regex modifier. Um, previously, it still allowed that. You know, if the if the input on the regular expression was in was coming from the user and it not was not checked correctly, um, you know, they could potentially sneak some PHP code in there, and the eval uh, modifier would execute that code as a part of the regular expression execution. So, not ideal. Um, it it was deprecated in five five, and it's going to be completely removed in seven. So you won't get uh, right now in five five. You'll get the deprecated message. But in 7, it'll just fail completely. Uh, there's also the concept of strict session handling in 5.5. Uh, you can use the strict session mode to prevent the uninitiated um, session IDs. So if somebody drops a session ID into a cookie and comes to your site, it's, you know, it's not going to start that session based on that session ID. Uh, if this is turned on, it generates that new session with a new ID and kicks that back to the user with whatever information is out there. Uh, either already in the session or you know what they're feeding into the session, uh, and that just kind of prevents session fixation overall. So that's the current stuff. Let's look at some of the fun stuff in seven. Again, this is a little bit more related to the security aspect. There's huge performance increases that are coming in seven. Um, there's lots of new operators and um, you know pieces of functionality. You can go look out there for articles about PHP seven and what's coming. Um, and you can see tons of different stuff, but first one I want to talk about is the scalar type hinting. Um, this actually allows you to uh, declare strict types on your input um, to your functions. Before you were use, you could only use stuff like array and callable, um, and either define a class or an interface that you wanted the uh, the value to come in as. Uh, you know, and it would throw you a warning. I think it actually throwed a error. I don't think it threw a warning. Um, you know, if those things didn't match up. Well, in 7, you can specify strict typing that also includes Boolean, integer, float, and string. Um, those are just kind of those base level. It's still, it still supports array, callable, and interface, all that. Um, but if you go in here and at the very top of your file, you turn on this declare with the strict types, it'll actually uh, check those types on the function inputs. Uh, and throw you back a warning or a an error. I forget which one it is. Um, unfortunately, the way that this was implemented, this declare has to go at the top of every file, uh, which is not ideal. And there was a huge conversation on the, the PHP internals mailing list about that. Um, I say conversation. That's the very polite term for it. It was not, <laughs> not great. If any of you are subscribers to the PHP internals email list, you understand what I mean. It's not a happy place sometimes. And the scalar type hinting RFC, uh, this was actually the fifth version of this that made it through. Um, it had to get refined over and over and over again. And the original developer that put it out there just basically threw their hands up and and was like, here, you guys do it. <laughs> so unfortunately, you still have to put that at the top of every file that you want to use it in. Um, and it doesn't work on inherited files either. So you can't just put it at, the, at a top level include and have it cascade down through your application. Uh, in PHP 7, we also get return types. Um, you get, uh, get to specify the return type on a function. Uh, it'll throw a type error if it's invalid, if the strict typing is turned on. 
Um, if it's not turned on, then the types are coerced, but you can still specify these return types in PHP 7 without strict typing. I don't really know why you would want to, um, but you can specify them as a part of the, the right after the function definition right there. Um, so you can see, you know, this one would be coerced. That would potentially be an integer coerced into a float. And then this one with strict typing would have to be uh, an integer returned. Otherwise, it throws an error. Uh, I mentioned that random library. This is the thing that replaces that in PHP 7. There is actually a native uh, random number generator in PHP 7. Um, this was implemented directly in the language, replaces all those external tools, and replaces the bad practice of using the RAND or MT RAND to generate those random numbers. Uh, fortunately, some of the libraries have come up and have actually used better sources, like the OpenSSL pseudobytes, so that kind of stuff. Um, but this just takes the guesswork out of it, doesn't require you to include any other libraries, any other tools, and just drops it straight in. Uh, and you can see here the, the function names are super easy, random bytes, random int. Um, and then these are the sources that it pulls from. Uh, and this is the order that it pulls them from. Uh, sorry, no, that's the reverse order. It actually starts with U random and everything and then goes up. Um, obviously, the Windows is only on Windows. So there's also a uniform variable syntax that was introduced. Um, if you've used PHP, you understand how odd it can be about how it interprets variables. Um, you can see here in the, in the first example, you know, if you have the, uh, the dollar sign, dollar sign foo, barb as, the first column there is how it was interpreting it, and the second one is how it will be in PHP 7, um, you know, how they're grouped together like that. And you can kind of see, if you look at these different examples, you can kind of see how the interpretation between the different variable types or the different definitions can be a little bit confusing. Well, they kind of went in and they revamped how the variables are interpreted, um, you know, including objects and references, you know, the different, uh, different base types, all that kind of stuff, and made things behave a little bit better and behave a little bit more uniformly. Um, it also supports the nested double colon, parentheses, and operations on the function calls. Um, so sometimes, I'm, if you work with PHP, I'm sure you've seen the cannot use function in write context uh, when you're trying to evaluate the return from a function call. That gets rid of that and actually makes it work correctly and behave correctly. Uh, there is a little bit of Unicode update. PHP 7 does allow for an escape character on Unicode strings. Um, so you can actually escape that kind of stuff in your output um, and work with that in strings correctly. Um, it also works inside of um, you know, some of the string handling functions as well and not just outputting the strings. So you can get the correct length on it uh, on the Unicode string even though it's not, you know, even though it's got that escape character inside of it. Uh, another thing that was introduced in 7 is engine exceptions. Um, I'm sure everybody has seen the white page of death. If you've been working with PHP and had something fail, tosses a fatal error, and then the site just doesn't come up for some reason, or it doesn't respond you know, to an API call, that kind of thing. Um, in PHP 7, uh, you can actually catch those fatal errors now. They're thrown as an error, uh, an error type. Um, and this was actually, before PHP 7 went into the release candidate process, it was an engine exception, but they modified that and now it's just a standard error for the, the fatal errors. Uh, you can catch those. And there's other different, uh, different engine exceptions that kind of inherit from that base error. There's the type error, parse error, and assertion error. Um, so if you actually have a parse error in your code, it's not just gonna throw that that warning uh, message and just say, hey, you've got a parse error, you can actually catch that. So you're not displaying the file information. Um, you know, PHP is very helpful that way. It likes outputting as much information as possible whenever you throw an error, uh, or when, whenever an error is thrown, uh, especially if an exception is thrown. It sends out all sorts of lovely information about your application. Um, these new engine exception stuff lets you catch all that. Um, you know, you can set it in the default error handler, you can set it as a part of the default exception handler, 
um, you know, at the, the top level so that if you're not catching those exceptions and catching those errors directly, you can actually catch them globally as well. Um, there is the concept of a filtered unserialize. Um, before, there was an issue with um, the unserialized functionality in PHP where if a, an object was passed in and it was passed in with a destructor, the unserialized was actually destroying the object when it was done, and so it would fire that destructor off. So you could do anything you wanted to inside of that code. Um, this is still a problem today, but in PHP 7, they introduced the filtered unserialized where you can specify different allowed classes in there. Um, you know, you can say either, yes, I want to allow classes to be instantiated, no, I don't, the default's false, um, or no, sorry, the default's true, unfortunately, because of backwards compatibility. Um, or you can actually specify the classes, the specific classes, namespaced, I believe, you can even uh, put that in there uh, for the ones that you want, uh, want to be allowed to instantiate. Um, if it's not allowing it, or it's not in the allowed classes array, it generates this object uh, type of PHP incomplete class, and you can't do anything with it. You can look at the value, you know, you can essentially look at the variable and, you know, var dump it or whatever you want to do with it, but you can't operate on it, you can't do anything to it. So it kind of isolates it a little bit more. So, um, Wow, I really blew through these slides. Um, so why is this all important? Well, PHP, and I apologize to the people in the back, that's really small. Um, PHP right now is actually sixth on the list of top 10 languages overall. This is just generic programming languages. Um, and as far as languages used for web applications, you can see the huge, uh, the huge gap between PHP and ASP even. Um, and this was, yeah, I can show you the sources for these if you want to. Um, there's just, uh, I think it's W3Text and the, I think it's Tiobe, T-I-O-B-E index for the, uh, the different languages up there. Um, so PHP, I mean, I, I kind of wish that more people had shown up in here. I figured it wasn't gonna be a super popular, <laughs> popular topic at a security conference. Um, but it's good to see that there is some interest in it. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, as security practitioners and people that actually have the knowledge and understand how to write secure code, um, you know, I think we have a responsibility of going out there and providing that education to PHP developers. Um, I know a lot of developers that when I go to conferences and I give security talks, uh, development conferences, you know, a lot of them are just, they're freaked out by, you know, by what can happen to their applications. They, they just don't know, they don't understand. Um, you know, so going out there, talking to them about this, actually teaching them how to write this secure code, um, you know, is, is definitely something that's needed. You know, so you're not just, you know, keeping that information isolated and coming and saying, oh, you've got a bug here, you've got a bug here. Um, you know, they talked earlier about actually sitting down with the development team and teaching them about this stuff, you know, as a kind of a one-on-one -on -one or, you know, a group process instead of tossing it back over to the wall to the devs and saying, hey, you know, you've got an XSS issue right here, you need to fix it. Um, unfortunately, because of PHP's low barrier for entry, uh, it's super easy to pick up. Um, there have been a lot more people and a lot more movements uh, lately where PHP applications are becoming more robust. You know, there's actual object-oriented principles and full namespacing and, you know, full component-driven architectures behind these PHP applications. Um, and so that kind of ecosystem is growing. Um, unfortunately, there's always gonna be that group of people that pick up PHP either as a side kind of thing or, you know, they're like, oh yeah, I can totally do PHP. And they start writing these applications and have no idea about the security implications of it. Um, you know, so getting out there, educating the users is, uh, is always a good thing. Um, and obviously investing in open source languages and open source tools um, is always going to be advantageous, uh, you know, because of all the different groups out there that are using PHP, um, you know, and the different languages or the different uh, major projects like Drupal and WordPress, you know, that are based on top of that, that layer. Um, you know, if you're out there and you're educating people about PHP and secure coding, then it's only going to help the people that are using those systems, writing plugins for it, and actually understanding what they're doing, uh, rather than just, you know, 
writing scripts, one-off script kind of stuff. So anyway, that is it from me. I apologize for blowing through my slides really quickly. Um, does anybody have any questions, comments, limericks, jokes? Yes. Yeah, hang on. So we had the major exploit based on the unserialize in our application. I work for Magento. And um, is there anything in the older versions to protect against it? We, we you know, just changed the destructors and also moved to JSON and code uh, instead of unserialize. But is there anything to, you know, for the earlier versions to protect against? Um, for the, so the question is for the destructor, the object unserialization. Um, I'm trying to think. I know you can actually isolate that stuff, and I, I'll have to find the library. There is somebody that's come up with something where you can take that serialized string, and it does a, a safe unserialize on it, but it's an external library. It's not something that's built into the language that you can kind of modify the object with. So yeah. I don't remember the name of it offhand. Sorry. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh. Yeah. Oh, do you want to come up to the microphone? Oh. He's going to go over there with it. Yeah, so um, for my organization, we're a Java.net shop. We've got like 22 different business lines. They all kind of do their own thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of trust in Java and .NET, I guess, because there's a lot of structure there. They've been testing it for years, but we have some shops experimenting with PHP. And there's just a lot of bad press, you know, a lot of bad stuff out there previously. Yep. Um, and so you can say, okay, you know, some of these major issues have been addressed, this particular issue doesn't exist, that doesn't exist. Uh, but the concern is that the, um, in the case of if you have a less experienced coder coming in doing, app, uh, doing an application that we're gonna have to pay for, we're gonna have something that's much more vulnerable out there, we're gonna have to spend more on code review and stuff like that versus if we put them in a safe environment for .NET and Java where it's less hard to mess things up. So that, that's the argument, and I'm wondering if yeah. you think that really is the case, and you know, what, what can I do? I mean, these resources you provided are great. I hope you make them public, but mm -hmm. what else can I do to try and put them, you know, have them be bowling with safety lanes or whatever, so they can't do it better both? Yeah, no, and, and I think um, you know, one of the things you can definitely do is use some of the frameworks that are out there that actually have those vetted components. Um, the two that I mentioned, especially Symfony and Zen Framework, I would highly recommend. Um, they've been around for years. The version two of them have been around for years, and so they've been completely vetted by usage, by different, you know, different security organizations. Uh, the Symfony one that actually had a full audit, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, if they live a little bit more inside of that container, I think that might provide a little bit more of the structure that you're looking for. Um, there's also a lot more uh, resources lately that are more focused on full, good, solid principles for application development. Um, you know, with the whole composer and the whole component-driven uh, methodologies that have really come up lately, more people are paying more attention to the contents of the libraries that they're using, and they're not just blindly including this stuff. Um, you know, and, and the structure of those applications is becoming more and more robust versus, you know, here's a directory with 20 PHP scripts in it. You know, I'm actually going to create this MVC structure where, you know, I separate out my data logic and, you know, do validation at this layer and that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of those frameworks will actually help with that. You know, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Anyone else? Well, I actually have a question. Too. Yeah. What do you think about uh, Facebook epoch PM? And you know, we are talking about future of PHP and mm -hmm. PHP seven. How do you see you know changing the you know redesign and, and changing the engine of PHP in the future of PHP? So it's interesting, some of the stuff that's happened. Um, the HHVM and the hip hop stuff was actually kind of introduced before the big, really big push for PHP seven. Um, but a lot of that kind of thing has actually been reworked and reintroduced into PHP 7. Um, you know, HHVM had a lot of the strict typing. It didn't have it in exactly the same way that 7 is going to have it. Um, but there is a lot of stuff that was taken, kind of gleaned from the HHVM and put into 7. Um, there's still some stuff on their side, obviously the, the performance aspect of it, you know, compiling it down. That kind of stuff you're only going to get on that side. Um, but with PHP 7, there is a huge performance boost because they did go in and rewrite a lot of the base engine to, to make this stuff perform better. Yeah. Anyone? 
Oh, yep. Yep. Oh, okay. Cool. This is more just uh, not a specific question, but can you yeah. give us kind of an example of you know what something maybe you caught at Pardot or kind of like something you do during your normal work day or kind of war story? Um. So some of the stuff that I've currently done, um, you know, I've been there for about seven months or so. Uh, a lot of the stuff that I've had to do is dealt with XSS issues. Um, you know, we, we actually use an older version of the Symphony framework uh, that didn't do a lot of the output escaping automatically that the newer version does. Um, you know, it's not as good standardized kind of thing. Um, and so there's a lot of things that I had to go in and actually manually escape for that stuff. Um, you know, we do have a lot of JavaScript front end, so it was kind of a combination of that and the regular PHP, you know, strict standard HTML output. Um, you know, and a lot of times the, the really tricky part is escaping from multiple contexts. You know, so you output it to the page, but then you also have to go into the JavaScript and figure out how to escape it there correctly. Um, one of the things that I've done uh, is create a templating and escaping library um, that we're slowly implementing across our application. Oh. Have you guys um, used any of the automated tools that we've been seeing this you know, past few days, um, like Zap? Mm -hmm. Have you implemented you know, automated scanning of vulnerabilities or anything like that? Yeah, we have. Um, we've actually got the White Hat scanner running dynamic scans against the you know external instances. Um, we've done some static scanning internally, just some smaller tools. Um, and we've also used um, Burp and a little bit of Zap to to do some of our own testing. Um, and obviously, we have the internal Salesforce red team to help us out with our code. <laughs> um, as far as the Pardot code, I don't know for sure. Um, I, like I said, I haven't been with the company very long, but Jeremy's nodding his head. So yes, we have. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I think I know where this is going. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so I guess I would say that. Have you seen a safe way of using it? The, you know, so attackers can't drop arbitrary code into your uh, Compose application and stuff like that. So unfortunately, a lot of that stuff is automatic inside of Composer. Um, there's been that huge debate over you know, the certificate pinning and HTTPS, you know, all that kind of stuff. And there just really hasn't been a good solution that they've figured out yet for it, um, just because of the way that it installs libraries, unfortunately. Cool. Um, second question is, uh, you mentioned a couple of libraries that have been audited by security companies. Mm -hmm. Do you know that anyone is actually tracking libraries that have been audited? Um, so we can recommend them to our developers? Um, yeah, so the security advisories database thing that I mentioned, that one actually has you know, reports from different projects.